Hello everyone, welcome. It's Sitar here. I'm gonna be going live with um, Muniza in the, in the next few minutes and we're gonna be discussing um, some of the emotional um, turmoils that can happen in healing and um, just going to talk about um, how difficult it can be um, when family and friends don't necessarily support your healing journey and um, what you can do to navigate that. I've had so many um, conversations with clients um, about this difficulty and I think it's something um, that's really important to discuss. So if you do have any questions um, during the live, um, please um, just um, put them in the comments and um, and if we do have time at the end, we'll go over any questions that you guys have. Hello everyone, welcome. Nice to see everyone. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Sarah. Awesome. So I'm just gonna wait for Muniza to come on, but if you guys have any questions in the meantime, um, just post them. Oh, let me see if she's joined here. Can everyone hear me okay? Hi. <laughs> Is the audio okay? Awesome. Hello everyone, thank you for joining. Just waiting on Muniza here. I'm sure she got caught in something important. Hello from Holland, hi. Oh, thank you, Zora. Um, she said that Muniza is still on a call. Thank you for letting me know. Someone said, love the spinach and banana coconut smoothie you posted. I love that one too. It's a good one. Oh, Zora, she's coming. She said, thank you so much for letting me know.
we need to join just a second. All right. Hello. Um, Hi, so, sound, sorry. Hi. So people said that they can't hear me. So I just want to make sure you guys confirm that you can hear us. I'm going to go grab my headphones because okay. I need them for a second. Okay. Just okay. give me a minute. Great. Great. Thank you. Sounds back. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. uh, I, I don't see your video, but I'm sure once you get your headphones in, it'll be good. I yeah, how about now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but I can't see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I'm about to turn okay. this camera back on. Great. Just give me a second. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, yes, we're here. Yes. <laughs> how are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. It's been nonstop since, like, eight o'clock this morning. So I just finished a call with the membership for our Q&A call for the month. And they were all like, you got to go. I'm like, I know I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Did you need a snack or a drink or anything? I have everything right here. So I'm good. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for uh, asking. Yeah, no problem. So thank you for going on the slide with me. I think this is a really important topic to discuss. and I don't think it's talked about enough. And I, agree. I just your advice and your input so much. You're just so, so compassionate and lovely. And um, I've experienced this a lot in my clients. And I've actually, um, you know, speaking of like, you know, family and friends, not, you know, necessarily like supporting yeah. the healing and things like that. And yeah. I've actually go on phone calls with family members yeah. and just like good mm -hmm. discussions with them discussing like what healing looks like and why things can be slow and why we're doing the things that we're doing. Because I think it's really, the medical medium lifestyle is really counterintuitive to a lot of people who, you know, follow conventional um, med medical and nutrition advice, right? Because, yeah. you know, I think a lot of people get this a lot, like, you know, where is your protein coming from? Where is your this? Where is your that? What about healthy fats? And I think if you don't, if you haven't read medical medium information, it's really just, it's just really difficult to understand. Yeah. And um, I guess if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you some questions. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so I guess um, what, how do you recommend people stand up themselves when family and friends are not open to hearing about alternative modes of healing. Is there a way to support? Is there a way to go about this that won't alienate them or create anger? Yeah, I think there is a way to go about it. And I think the first most important thing is to be respectful. I think everyone involved, especially when you're asking for something different, is to be respectful and to understand that they're not you know, if they're not buying it, it's because most people don't buy it. It's not just something wrong with your family, right? That it's very, it's a very normal thing to resist this. And we see this across the board. Like everybody's like, what? This is crazy. Just like you, you, you shared. Um, but I think it's to be respectful because it doesn't matter whether you're choosing a path of healing that your family doesn't agree with. You could be choosing a career that your family doesn't agree with. You could be choosing to marry somebody your family doesn't agree with. You could be choosing to do any number of things that your family doesn't agree with. You could be voting for the wrong person and they would get mad at you, right? Mm -hmm. You could be like not wanting to get certain treatments and they get mad at you. Like it's been, mm -hmm. it's been so obvious. Like if you're not following mainstream or you're not thinking about what they want you to do, that matters. And so if you have a history with your family, on such matters where it's like a problem when you do something different and they don't agree, then I would say approach with even more caution, mm -hmm. right? That don't, don't like assume that they're just going to have to accept this or get mad at them because they aren't accepting this. It's sort of go in with caution and be like, okay, well, I know that I'm struggling with this issue and I'm choosing a path that you're not going to love or like, I already know this, but I wanna give you the benefit of the doubt and I wanna share it with you. And I have no judgment on you if you don't accept it. But what I do ask for, and which is normal for anyone to request from a family member, is that even if you don't agree with me, like, let's, can you support me? Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that many, many couples, it's truth, right? Like, couples don't agree on everything. Like, it's just not, it's just not possible. I've been married, I've been married 20 years, and I've been with my partner for 
my husband for 23 years and we do not agree on everything even today we don't agree on everything but we set up um a uh a kind of mutual understanding in the beginning to say like we won't agree on everything but that even if we don't agree that we respect each other's choices and support each other with our choices because it's each of us is our own person and following our own path so especially when it comes to body autonomy and choices about our body it is really important to respect that so I know him and I had this understanding and I wish that so many more couples would start off with that understanding. But I think that people start off with like certain, like they start off thinking the same way about things. And then as you grow as a human being and you develop and you have spiritual growth or you like find new information as is normal, right? That you would want to try it out. But again, you come up with that. Yes, I know I'm veering away from what we used to do together and this will change some things but let's work it out and how we can do this because are you willing to support me and i think that that asking a question in that way is are you willing to mm -hmm. when you ask with respect and you ask especially if it's a partner and you know i've done a lot of work around understanding how men's brains and women's brains work and i think men are very much wired to provide and to protect their loved ones so so if you ask your partner, and men are also very willing to help. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that many women um, give men a bad name. And I say that because I did that too. And it took a lot of like learning for me to understand that my husband had very good reasons for thinking the way he did, for acting the way he did. And when I started to have respect for those ways of thinking and actually what he was really trying to do was to help me or to protect me, but I didn't understand it. I would get mm -hmm. mad and as many women do, we wouldn't like, oh my God, he doesn't pick up his socks or he doesn't do this or he doesn't do that. But when you start to understand that a man's brain is wired to do like this one thing and he focuses on this one thing and he gets to it, like if he's trying to get ready to go to work in the morning, what that involves is getting out of bed, brushing his teeth, taking a shower, changing, getting in the car, going to, going to work. Mm -hmm. That doesn't involve picking up the socks and everything else on the way. Like a man's right. brain becomes really focused on the specific, um, like these specific like actions. So I think a lot of misunderstanding happens between couples and mm -hmm. between family members because we don't understand each other. And often when we see somebody on a healing path and they're making, now they're making choices on their food and things that impact the family life at the core level. And there's dis disruptions in the family unit because of it that's because there's already disruptions in other places. Mm. The, MM, the MM tools and using these tools to heal is not the first place the disruption shows up often. It has happened to, I know some people it's happened to, that that's their first place that they're totally veering away from each other. And, and it's okay to explore that in the relationship. And it's okay to come back to it and say, okay, well, I'm... I know we're, we're verging away from each other in these choices. And are you still willing to support me? And give examples maybe of where you have supported your partner, even though you didn't agree with what they were doing, right? Yeah. Have, you made, have you made them their morning cup of coffee, even though you don't agree that coffee is healthy? That's a, that's a way of supporting someone. That's the same as asking your partner, could you make me celery juice when I can't get out of bed in the morning? Like mm -hmm. you may not agree with it, but would you respectfully do it to support? I think those two are completely different things. I think a lot of people will connect, oh, I'm, I don't agree with this, to I won't support you. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to differentiate those things. And also, as people who are healing, we also need to um, acknowledge that it's a change for the people in our lives. We need to be sensitive to that just as we want them to be sensitive to us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes while we're sick and we're like, oh my God, but I'm sick and I'm on Mattress Island and I don't want to be the one to be sensitive, sometimes to bridge that gap, it is what the best thing is, the most compassionate thing you can do is to be sensitive to what somebody else's needs are. Mm -hmm. And because, because you're trying to get your own needs met in doing that, right? right? And I could say, well, 
it's just manipulative or whatever and people can be like mad about that but actually that's just how human relationships work right Right. so people do things for each other always there's okay maybe there's not always an expectation but there is a level of like okay i it's a give and take in any relationship in any partnership and then also if you have a, a difficulty in your family relationships then the, the wounding between like a child living at home with their parents because they're now sick and now under, under the roof of their parents who are sick. Oh, they're not sick, but they, um, the parents aren't sick, but the child is sick is it's very sad. It's very sad to have to do that. And for parents to turn their children away, which I've seen time and time again, um, mm-hmm. it's just very sad. I have three children and if they needed me, I know that I would be there for them. Like, even if I didn't agree, I'm right. like, I'm not going to abandon my children, but that's just me. And I, I don't know, like I see this happening and I'm like, how does one go back and want to repair that relationship? The, the parental relationship can be really hard. I find that's almost harder mm-hmm. than trying to mend or work out like a, like a partnership, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. So I can it's, see- it's a long and that's I'm sure we can have a four hour conversation about that too because yeah that is um incredibly painful as well but I really like how you noted like you know when you do want to ask for support if you give respect you're more likely to get that respect as well and I think um yeah. I think um when you're sick especially like your nervous system and your adrenals are just so sensitive you come out of this place of fear when you're asking for that kind of support yeah. but I think the asking for willingness to support, you know, instead of saying like, hey, I, I need you to be 100% on board, you have to support me. Um, you know, that's, that's going to push that person away instead of saying like, hey, like, I really need to do this for myself. I want to do this for my health. I truly believe with every cell in my body that this is going to work. Yeah. Are you to support me? I think it's much easier to get people on board. So yeah, thank you so much for um, bringing that up. Um, yeah, that I had was and um, I, I experienced this a little bit on my healing journey, but a lot of people accused are, are accused of like, you know, being a hypochondriac or being overreactive, or they just need to listen to their doctors because their doctors know best. And um, how would you, how would you navigate this? What, what are some recommendations that you have? Well, everyone's got something they are really kind of into or kind of crazy about. Everybody mm-hmm. does. So like my mom loves to clean, like she'll clean for days and she's like obsessed. She says it I'm like, I'm obsessed with cleaning. Like I have to clean. I'm like, okay, as long as you own that, because then I'm obsessed with health. So like, I respect that you want to clean and that's what you want to do, but then respect that I want to be like into my health. And, you know, again, it comes down to, are you, you know, you're being a hypochondriac, the conversation that I would have with someone who says that say to me is um, that feels really negating of my experience. So a hypochondriac is a negative word and it's about being obsessed with your health in an unhealthy way. But what about being obsessed with your, whatever you're obsessed with in a healthy way and there are those things. Mm -hmm. So is the only connotation you can think of a negative one or do you believe that perhaps there are some positive aspects to what my choices are you may not agree with them but as a rational human being can you look at the choices and think okay well i agree that perhaps there's elements of this that aren't totally negative and um i think a lot of disconnect happens because chronically sick people go to the doctor and the doctor says you're okay, or there's nothing wrong with you, or the doctor says that, um, you know, um, that you have such and such disease and you need such and such medication, and then you go against doctor's advice. And I believe that many people think that's crazy, Mm -hmm. legitimately. It's not okay to go against medical advice, then you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think what needs to happen is more education, more understanding as to why a person is wanting to make that choice. So if you're going against the mainstream and going against the grain of what most people do, do you have a good good reason for that? Mm -hmm. And 
to be open to sharing that with your family. Like if they're judging you and you saying to them, instead of getting angry or criticizing them or judging them back, saying to them, what if I have a really good reason for that? Are you willing to hear me? Mm. That you may not agree with my reason, but I have a really good reason for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to educate people about, well, this is, we have a bonus in the membership this year, and it's about winning the spiritual battle. And one of the uh, tools that we've been sharing a lot with people um, in, that, in that course is really how, to educate people about what the systems that exist really are because it takes a deeper look to really start to think differently about mm -hmm. it and you have to go back to your own journey and think okay when did when did i started to go when did i start to go down that rabbit hole what was the turning point for me when i started to go down so think back to your own journey and what triggered you to start to believe that right so if you can go back and and share that journey with them and say, this is where I started to believe that the medical system cannot offer me everything that I need. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think that it's a crime to focus on nutrition, um, supplementation, and, and I'm choosing not to do drugs because of X, Y, Z reason, like I react to them, or there are side effects, or um, I don't do well on them. Or people might have a history of saying, well, I've been around this merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been in the rat race of the medical system for a long time and I haven't had any answers. So do you really blame me for trying something different? Right. Um, would, would you, like if you were up against the gun and God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, you end up with cancer. Like, and the, the doctor, in fact, this morning, I was speaking to a client who told me, well, um, my doctor said that basically they're just waiting for me to mm -hmm. die. I'm like, the doctor told you that? And she goes, yep. And he's like, do whatever you want. And so because the doctor said that, now the family's being more kind of accepting of whatever choices there are mm -hmm. because there's no other choices. But then people can arrive at that conclusion on their own without needing a doctor to actually say it. Right. Because doctors very well know that they aren't curing shit. Right. right. And so I think that that conversation in a broader context in a chronic illness person's family needs to be happening. Mm -hmm. Like they, they know it, they are telling you this, that they aren't curing anything. So you take doctors to, you take your family to the doctor visit and you say like, is there a cure for this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, there's a cure for this. Then is there a cure? Like it's gonna go away and, the doc and you poke and ask deeper questions and you'll learn that there really is no cure. They really don't have an answer. They're going to give you a medication and so are you willing to accept that as your family member? Do you want me to accept something kind of mediocre? Right. In that I have to accept this. Like, would you accept anything other than excellence for your own health? Like looking for a solution and looking for an answer. Like, can you really blame me for keep seeking and trying something that could make this turn around? And that I've heard stories that people um, have shared about this working for me. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, why, why can we not have this and approach this conversation in a more rational way? Right. Yeah. Because oftentimes that person is accused of being that's they're the irrational one. Right. So I think that's really empowering to say something like that. And I think, you know, like you said, it really is about providing the facts. Yeah. Right. Because if you are the sick person and you are you are the hybrid contract, you're the crazy one. But yeah. when you, you provide it in a really cool, calm, collected manner, you know, providing a lot of objective information like, hey, like these are my options, but this is also what I want to try. Um, no surgeries, no invasive procedures, you know, yeah. just the power of yeah. the foods that we have on this. Why, why is that so crazy? Like, yeah. we don't, it's crazy when people will have open heart surgeries and get cancer treatments and things like that. But it's crazy to think that, you know, using nutrition can help, you know, heal and repair the body. Um, so yeah. I think really um, enforcing that and reiterating that is really, really powerful. Yeah. And there are so many stories with people healing even lesser things by just getting rid of processed food. I don't think anyone can argue that processed food is bad for you. Mm. So, you know, I think starting there and saying, well, processed food's bad for you anyway. So let's just, let's just get rid of that. Right. Let's just take that out of the picture or, you know, eating, you know, eating what else? Like, 
sodas and, and things like drinking sodas or eating, um, even like eating healthy, healthier food that's not fast food, but right. eating out more often means that you're not really getting cleaner food. Um, you don't know what they're putting in the food. You don't know what oils they're cooking with. I think these are legitimate conversations to start by educating your family. I have a whole section on health documentaries in my Amazon store, and I put them there because people struggle with these conversations. I'm like, sit and watch a documentary together, like Food Matters or, or you know, um, health, um, Healthy for Change, um, which is all about processed sugar. And then there's there's just so many out there now that, you know, you can come to. I mean, you don't even have to go as uh, extreme as super size me to, I think most people will accept that McDonald's is really not healthy for you, right? So then what does constitute health and good health and wellness? Like if you're up and about, and I say to people, like I've said to my mother who, who got mad at me for leaving behind my finance career mm. and searching careers and wanting to do nutrition. And she's like, well, we kind of, you know, educated you and we did all this and I'm like, I hear you, but at the end of the day, I would say to her, I'm like, you're not living in my body. I have to live in my body. Right. She, she also has been around my father for, you know, decades now who's been sick. So there's times that he, he doesn't want to do something. And she has learned to kind of respect that too, which is like, he's sick. It's his body, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that it matters to tell people, but you're not living in my body. So if you chose today to go get reconstructive surgery on your, on your face or on your breasts or, you know, whatever you wanted to do to change up your body and, but it's your body. So mm -hmm. I would try to understand, I may not agree with you, but if it's something that you wish to do, then would I just not, talk to you ever again because you chose to do this thing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're because you're family you can't get away from you right. can never change that you're going to be family until the end of time mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so either can we make this harmonious or can we are we going to make it difficult because choosing harmony also helps to reduce stress and to create an environment that's more positive in the home and if you have children then choosing harmony matters and here's what I explain about harmony. I'm a musician and I love harmony. And harmony is created by two different notes or three or four or 10 different notes, all that sync up with each other. And when you play them together, they sound beautiful, but they're all different. And you couldn't get that beauty by them being the same note. Mm. Therefore, it is totally possible to live in harmony with different choices being made in the home and create something utterly beautiful, even in that space. It's what you choose to focus on. And if you have children that you're raising, then creating that harmony is ever more important, especially around food, because it is a basic relationship everybody has for the rest of their life. Mm. Yeah, I love that. So it's less about, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like if we're going to be asking for respect for our choices, we should be giving respect as well. And it's okay to have people who have different viewpoints in your, yeah. in your life and then just, you know, ask for harmony more than anything else. Yeah. And I, I actually, I have used this with my own family, which is why I say it like my, you know, my mother and I have had a, I mean, I love my mom dearly, dearly, dearly. And we have had, we're similar, we're strong personalities and we clash a lot and have over the years. And I remember saying to her one time, I said, she asked, she said, well, it sounds like you don't like, you know, respect us or want us around or whatever. And I'm like, no, I definitely respect you. I want you around and I need us to live in harmony. Mm -hmm. I said, we can have different choices, but the love that we have for each other exists. The love that you have for your grandchildren exists. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And I think that there's so much good. We don't have to focus on the negative stuff every time we're together why don't we focus on what's really good mm -hmm. like we're blessed to have each other we're blessed to have family we're blessed that you care I mean the reason you're upset that I'm not doing what you're doing is because you care and I and I want to honor that and I want to appreciate that and let's show up in ways for each other that feels truly supportive so for example my sister visited and you know we don't eat 
animal protein, but she, you know, warned me. She's like, look, I really need it. I don't feel well if I don't have it. Of course, that was a different conversation with her. But then, <laughs> <laughs> but then I went to the best place I could find to find the cleanest like fish and because I told her is fish okay and she's like yeah and I ordered it for her and I stocked up the freezer with some frozen fish like burgers and stuff mm -hmm. and my mom said to her mm -hmm. you're like a guest of honor like she has not done this for anybody in like 15 <laughs> years <laughs> but I think that my sister really appreciated it. And as a result of me maybe doing that and offering her that, uh, meeting her where she needed to be met, even though I don't agree with it and I wouldn't do it myself, um, she was very open to listening to me share about why she was even feeling that way. Mm -hmm. And we had this very in-depth conversation about her own health. And she has gone back home and implemented a lot of what I'm saying and is starting to feel much, much, much better and going, realizing I don't really need meat every meal. So, yeah. you know, like, I think that we need to meet each other in the middle and meet each other where we can and do the best like to meet each other. Because I feel like a lot of people today is like, it's my stuff or not at all. Like, mm -hmm. everybody acts like it's all or nothing. And relationships are not all or nothing. A lot of relationships are about give and take right it just yeah. it just is healthy relationships are give and take i mean marriage is hard work people tell me oh you guys make marriage look easy i'm like oh my god it's not easy yeah it's not easy it's really hard and we have to work through things constantly even with my kids people tell me mm -hmm. uh, people people have said to me when I was telling my, I was telling somebody the other day that when I was in like a coaching session and we had like six people in the coaching session and, and I was telling someone, oh, like, it's okay. Like my kids too, like my youngest daughter for years ran around the house, not trying to have her celery juice. And she's like, oh my God, really? Your daughter? It seems all so perfect. I'm like, but it's not right. Like it can be so easy to trick yourself into thinking someone else's family is perfect it's hard work i when people say to me how do your kids eat the way they do it's hard work because you are battling all the messages from the outside you're battling how not to make them feel like they're crazy or weird you're battling educating them enough educating their friends enough you know like it's uh it's like a full-time job <laughs> like it doesn't just happen by the way you have to consciously kind of create um, the, the environment, you have to cultivate the relationship, you have to cultivate, um, the education. I mean, it takes a huge amount of conscious effort to, to bring ease into something that you're choosing to do that's different than mainstream. Right. But see, that's not new to me because I moved to this country as a minority. I moved to this country as a, um, you know, I'm a Muslim minority Pakistani woman. Um, being a woman, I was a minority wherever I grew up in my full-time jobs, I was a minority there. So fighting for something that I've always, I've always had to fight for everything that I've had, anything good that has come into my life, anything that I can be proud of today, I've had to fight for it. Nothing was given to me or handed to me, even a little bit. Everything was like fighting for it. Mm -hmm. So I guess like if you're used to that, then this is just one more thing you take on and you're like, okay, let's just make this happen and we'll figure out how, but it's, it does take so much conscious awareness of like our health, our healing, our emotions, our PTSD, our, um, it takes a lot, lot of like cultivation of education. Um, constantly talking about it, sharing the truth. You know, when, you know, one of my, one of my daughters was like, Oh, like I woke up sweating. I'm like, mm. and she's like, mom, you're going to about, you're about to tell me that it's got to do with something like my liver or something. I'm like, yep. <laughs> and so of course we always pull out the medical medium book and we educate because it's a moment of like that learning. Like, why is that happening? Cause it's not just a symptom that I'm going to let you like toss off and be like, oh yeah, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. Like many people would probably do that, but that doesn't happen in our home. Mm -hmm. And so my kids sometimes will say, 
oh my gosh, you always go on and on about these symptoms and what they're what, like little things. And they'll be like, well, I sometimes think that I'm really sick. I'm like, but you're not, <laughs> you're not really mm -hmm. sick. These are little things that you're educating yourself on to understand like what is going on? Like, why is it showing up? And so I have to tell them, you're not really sick by the grace of God, because that could turn on a dime for anybody, right. anywhere, anytime in today's world. It's so toxic, right? Mm -hmm. So that education, like, again, with the kids too, it's always finding those moments. It, it is kind of like, as a parent, it's kind of like a battle. Like, it's not easy to go against the grain. It's not easy to constantly be educating but you have to like i feel like i have to do that with them with god and religion and faith as well because the messaging out there is so crazy when mm -hmm. it comes to that right? Mm -hmm. right it's just so many mixed messages and where do you go for the truth so i have to hold up that wall as well really really hard for the kids around like this is a hard no this is you know this is like we have to always remember i always tell them the path to god is a narrow path it says so in every biblical scripture. It says it in the Torah. It says it in the, in the Bible. It says it in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And I and they ask me, what does that mean? And I say the same thing to them. I'm like, it's the same with health. The path to health is narrow. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, because think about it. How many temptations are there to do the wrong thing? How many temptations are there to walk away from what God has ordained for us to do or God is commanding us to do or doing God's will versus your own will? That's the internal battle that we're always facing, right? Mm -hmm. And so coming into explaining about health too, I'm like, it's a narrow path. I'm like, look at the path that I walk. And they're like, oh yeah, mom, your path is like really, really, really on the straight and narrow, right? And I'm like, but why? It's not out of choice. It's not out of like, oh, my free will. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, I'm going to eat fat free and raw and I'm going to like be like this and I'm gonna eat my greens. Nobody does this because they woke up one morning and you're like, oh, yeah, good idea. I'm going to do that. Right. They had to. You didn't have, have a choice at one point yeah. and you were struggling so much and motherhood was at stake. Mm. So you do it because that's what it's, is at stake. Right. And I said, you three are born of me. I said, autoimmune rather in our family in that sense my father has had a very severe condition i've had very severe conditions and now my children i have to fight so that they don't go to those conditions or don't even come close to developing those types of conditions right. that's what i tell my family when they get at me mm -hmm. i'm like it's not just about my body i have to raise these three girls and I have to keep them healthy. And I live in a country where I don't have family near me. Mm. I'm like, there are people I know, they have their grandparents nearby, they have their sisters nearby, they have uncles, aunts, cousins nearby. I said, I have no one. So if something happens to me, who's gonna look after my kids? Right. So, so it's not a question. Like mm -hmm. nobody gets to question what I choose for my children. And mm -hmm. my parents and my family have actually not only learned to respect that, you know, cause after my mom and I had, tiffs about this thing she um six months later my sister calls me and she goes by the way mom is now like changed the oil in the house she's changed the salt in the house she's like you know changed the cooking pots i'm like she changed the cooking pots i'm like why and you go she read this article about how like the teflon was like really toxic and then she saw you change your cooking pot. So she's like, if Manisa's done it, then maybe I'll do it. But she never said it to me directly. <laughs> so like, you know, like you can see that, that this, the influence, it trickles, but it also like, like the more, more I feel like people will say, well, their families disrespect them or lose respect for them because of their choices. But there's ways to build that respect back by having a con honest conversation. I feel like you're disrespecting me. Why have you lost respect for me? Mm -hmm. I'm still your connection. I'm still your child. I'm still the same human. Like, are we in this world today that we're going to break family relations because we're making different choices? I mean, right. come on. I mean, if my grandmother was alive today, I've taken her recipes. I've converted them, so many of them, into healthier versions. Would she have disowned me if I did that? I would hope not, right? I would hope that she would be proud of right. me. 
I would, and that's what we want from our family members. We want to make each other proud. We want to do right by people. And I just, you know, it's a big, heavy conversation and it can go in so many directions. Um, and when people say that you don't believe that I'm a hyper, the hypochondriac conversation or, you know, or being told that you're orthorexic, right? Because that's another weaponized term to tell somebody that their eating habits just are not okay mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. to tell someone oh you should eat in moderation that was told to me many times right. and i say to people so you want to be in moderation and so basically when you're being in moderation you're really not committing to anything right <laughs> you know you're being moderately sick and not very sick but not health yeah you want to you want to consume poisons moderately. Okay, I get that, yeah. right? Um, yeah, and I, I had this conversation years ago. I mean, I mean, almost 16 years ago now, I was pregnant with my oldest and we were, you know, my, I had converted my, I'd just been to nutrition school and my whole home had been converted to more organic, like even like the products, skin products and things like that. And my parents were just completely alarmed. And they were like, sat me down and gave me this pep talk. And they were like, this is crazy. Like you've gone like all extreme and like you should do things in moderation. And this conversation just went on and on and on. And one day I got really upset because then they started talking about how I was going to raise my child and it was the child would be so like stressed out or not being raised well because of all these idiosyncrasies that I was exhibiting. <laughs> I went to the the kitchen sink cabinet and under the cabinet there was a, this old bottle of Raid I still hadn't gotten rid of. So I picked up the bottle of Raid and I came and I put it on the dining table. I'm like, you're welcome to add pesticide to any of your food if you have such a problem with eating pesticide-free food. And there was like pin drop silence at the dining table and nobody ever said anything about it to me again. Wow. Because they got that. I mean, like you, you guys are like, crossing lines it's not okay mm -hmm. and i think that um many people don't express well what is bothering them right or they don't express well in a way that another person understands what is bothering them and so that conversation i, I guess i was blessed with the gift of gab because i can just <laughs> people tell me i should have been a lawyer i would have made a good lawyer i think because my mom she's like you can argue just about anything. It's impossible to like argue with you because you will just keep going when you believe that you're right. Like you will go, go, go. And I'm like, yeah. But that's also like that part of me that's like into like justice and truth. So I will keep going because I believe in it, right? So I don't think that everybody necessarily can maybe express the way I express or I didn't think about that before. It just came to me like in the moment and I'm like, oh, like, it just came to me. But I want people to be empowered enough to say something, talk about how you're really feeling, right? Like talk about like, I'm really bothered by blah, 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 but keep it respectful. I'm really, I'm really triggered by, I'm really bothered by when you did this. I would really like it if you would not do that. Um, I would really appreciate it if you could respect what I, what my wishes are. I also want to live in this home, but I don't want to feel like I'm being um, you know, kind of sidelined in a way. And it can be like, like Divine Light Laura is saying, I think they, deep down they're beyond afraid to look at their own choices. It can be that. But I also think it's got to do with just people believing that they know what's better. Yeah. You know, it's just this like parents think they know better than their children. And like even when they're 60, 70, 80 years old, they still think they know better because they've lived life longer and I don't think that it creates yeah. like, a, like just because you live longer doesn't mean, mean you know better right. like I think that there's a whole other to me when my children were born like, like I remember holding Hanan as a newborn baby and I just looked straight and it's like day she was not even a day old and I'm looking into her eyes and it's like can you feel that soul connection with such a young baby and I'm like, she's here to teach me things. Mm -hmm. And I've always kept that mindset open because I knew that I learned things better than my parents did, but they weren't always willing to listen. 
or it was struggle. Like we eventually got there, but at first it was always resistance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I don't want to do that to my children. Like I want to have an open connection. I want to understand their minds. I want to understand how they think and what, what makes them tick or, you know, what makes them like come alive. I want to know that. And I'm curious about that. So, so I would say that it's it's about, about mutually like having these types of conversations with family members and keeping it an ongoing conversation, mm -hmm. not just a one-off conversation about when your health comes up. I think using opportunities to educate when they organically present themselves is important. I think using opportunities to highlight stuff that shows up in the media that could you know like we always talk about Novak Djokovic winning the you know being the greatest of all time I mean the guy is 36 years old I'm a huge Federer fan I'm a huge tennis fan and I love Roger Federer and at 36 he was crumbling whereas Djokovic is like he's only getting started there has to be something said for a lifestyle right mm -hmm. there has to be something said about what he's eating like everybody cares about everyone every sports person what they're eating is like a such such a huge topic of conversation then right. when they're plant-based why aren't we why aren't we having that conversation more like mm -hmm. why aren't we opening up and i think it's sort of opening up our family members to conversations but not doing it in a way that's conflicting you know mm -hmm. like conflict is never going to resolve anything when we start to conflict with each other the walls go up guards go up you're not going to make a connection Mm -hmm. to to open people up to new ideas you have to make a connection mm -hmm. you have, have to come from the heart you have to talk from the heart and you have to find those places that you connect more mm -hmm. than when you diverge more right because when you go into conflict it can be a never-ending story mm -hmm. you both have to decide no more conflict you have to decide, okay, I'm not going to do this. Right. Um, how do we connect? And seeking connection, I think, is the most powerful thing we can do as humans for anybody. Mm -hmm. And then seeking connection, I always say, in the way that I've struggled with relationships, if it's a hard relationship, and we all have some of those, um, I look for what I can be grateful for in a person that is, I find it hard to be grateful for in general. What can I be grateful for? You wanna look for it, mm -hmm. like you have to seek it. I mean, there have been times where I've been mad at my husband and don't wanna think anything good about him. We all go through those like, you know, I mean, I'm, it's a very, very honest conversation. Right. We all do it in relationship, right? You're mad at somebody, the thoughts aren't good. And, you know, through work and training and coaching myself, getting that for myself has been, okay, well, how do we, how can I think of, okay, can I, in this moment where I'm so angry, can I separate my anger about this one thing and not make it about the whole person? And what can I find that I can be grateful for, um, for this person, even though right now I'm harboring feelings of anger towards them? Because it's not painting the whole picture with the, this one color and just making it really specific about this one thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that many people who are in relationship, they they just get so colored. We're not seeking positive connection where, you know, you have to seek it. You have to want it. You have to cultivate it. You have to work at it. Yeah. And especially if it's already hard to get. So when we're sick, I think the issues that are already existing, they just come flying to the surface and just just presents more opportunities for healing. If you're absolutely, if you're willing to go there, yeah, yeah. So it seems like, and I think it's really hard because I think a lot, at least when I was really sick too, like a lot of people with chronic illness maybe don't have like the mental or the emotional energy to really have these difficult conversations. Yeah. And what I like writing it out or making it into a voice memo or recording it on your phone or something like yeah. that. Um, yeah. So do you have any other advice with that? Because I do know, like, I, I'm, I'm really sensitive, so I get really easily emotionally drained, even not, even when I'm healthy, I'm, I'm still really a sensitive person. So what, do you have any other recommendations for that? 
lots. So one of the reasons we wrote a blog post, which is an open letter to partners of those who are chronically sick, we wrote it because it was hard for people to have those conversations on their own. So lean into that resource. Use this live as a resource to um, share with people what these conversations in an honest way can look like without judging anybody, you know? We're not here to judge your partners or your family members who are being difficult to you. We're here to support them too. Mm -hmm. Like, what do, you, what do they need? Right. What, like, people have needs. Often our needs are not met. So then we pull back. But if we're really seeking out to meet each other's needs, then, then yes, while we're limited when we're sick to meet people's needs, we still can check in, ask, do what we can from the limited place that we're at mm -hmm. and and acknowledge we can acknowledge say i understand you must be struggling i'm not the same person you married i'm different now and what is that like for you right yeah. or encourage them to have that conversation with someone who can hold space for them right. number one right right um another tool is to use the speaking your truth shot that shot works amazingly and it works wonders. It's also about finding the three shots at the end of the stabilizer sections are the speaking your truth stabilizer, the intuition stabilizer, wisdom and intuition stabilizer, and the finding your purpose stabilizer shots. I find that they're very potent. I've done the three together and I found like, oh my gosh, like I got heard so much better. I had a real problem when I was younger about being heard. Nobody heard me mm. and it's hard to see it's hard for people who see me now to think um gosh like who would never hear you i was never heard i felt invisible to my friends i felt invisible in my family i felt like i had to fight like, remember i said i had to fight for everything i was always fighting for it, it was never easy to be heard mm -hmm. or seen or understood so i feel like like those shots really make it much easier and then the angel of strength the angel of free will um those make it easier as well and what if you have ptsd and adrenaline from trying with the really hard people that makes you sick um record a voice memo record a video and say that i would this is how i would like to interact with you please do not come raging back at me just listen to what i've said process what i've said because i really am coming from a place of love and concern because i care about our relationship i think that when you can make somebody feel like you really care for them you're going to create a connection mm -hmm. right and we can make people feel cared for and feel seen even when we're on mattress island because of the questions that we ask the interests that we take in their lives maybe we don't have a lot of energy to talk but maybe we can send a lovely email and say, hey, I'm really tired and I haven't been able to check in, but I'd love to know what's going on in your life. And maybe if you could email me back and let me know, I'd love to read about it and learn more. And mm -hmm. just, I mean, if somebody did that to me, I'd be so touched, yeah. you know, like, oh, you like, you really want to know about my life. And sometimes some people are harder to get through because of they're they're just, you know, they have more anger or they're just more difficult to get through to, but there's always a way. There's right. always a way. Everyone has a vulnerable point. Mm -hmm. And when you live with them, you know what those are, right? So instead, don't turn their vulnerability against them. Don't use it against them. Use it to support them. Use it to show love and support. Yeah. And like, there are people in the comments saying things like, you know, my family doesn't take mold seriously or fragrances seriously. And I think it, like, it matters to educate, you know, to say, hey, I'm coming from, I'm not insane. Here's a movie that explains kind of what I go through. Mm -hmm. Stink, for example, is a great movie to lean into there. Um, but also if you're struggling with mold, like there's documentaries about mold as well. There's actually two or three of them. And you can watch those with your family members to say like it just because it doesn't affect you doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's what a canary in the coal mine, like if you put any other bird in the coal mine, it won't warn you, but a canary will. Why is a canary, why is a canary special? So you have to give them frames of reference that will make sense to them. Like I love using frames of reference that are sporting references with men 
that I speak to car references with men that I speak to men get cars and sports. They just do. They're wired. There's a reason that their men are more drawn to those, those, those things in life than women are. And then with women more like feeling intuitive thinking, um, emotional connection is what women want. And it's about also understanding like, okay, here are ways to connect. Here's what we can use to see each other. And men and women are different. If you tell a man, I just feel that this is the right step for me, he's not going to really honor that. Mm -hmm. Because men don't really feel the way women do. Men think. So if you are talking to a guy, tell him, I think this is helping me and I think this is working rather than using the word feel. Because thinking mirrors what he does or he connects with. And so a lot of communication is about connecting with the person in front of you. Like even in, like I've done a lot of communication training, corporate communication training. I was in corporate for 13 years, um, you know, like uh, nonviolent communication training. I mean, like all kinds. And so one of the things that they teach you is that you want to mirror the person you're talking to. Like, for example, your head is leaning to one side. So if I lean my head across that and I nod when you're nodding, it's a kind of like an unspoken verbal, like nonverbal language of connecting with a person, even if you're not using words to connect with them. Right. So another thing is if you sit with arms crossed and pulled back, body language speaks volumes. And so if you open up your heart and you connect from the heart, you open yourself up, you open your arms, you lean forward, you show interest, you make eye contact, all those ways of communicating matter. Like if you're trying to have this conversation with your partner and he's on his phone mm -hmm. and you're like looking at the TV, you're not gonna really make a connection. Mm -hmm. You need to put the devices away and you need to make eye to eye connection. Like sometimes when my partner's mad at me, he won't make eye connection with me. He'll be looking at the ground, looking here, looking there. And I keep saying, okay, my eyes are here. I'd love to connect with you. Can you look at me? And it takes a lot because he's mad and he's like looking away. And then the body language, I love observing people all the time. I, I, I observe people all day long, actually. Mm -hmm. So, and I love doing it. I'm kind of low key, very fascinated by human body language. So um, I watch people people and I'm like okay are we making a connection with this person or are we not right mm -hmm. even when we're coaching and working with people every day like are you leaning forward and making a connection or this person is this person getting switched off and are they moving away and it's very important to track that while you're speaking to someone too mm -hmm. and with family because we have so much history with our families it's very easy to fall into like a holding pattern of what you just normally do with them and to break out of that holding pattern takes a lot more work and conscious effort. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know where we were going, but. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, I I, 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 I'm, you know, taking down a lot of points and um, you did mention, and I think, um, you know, using uh, for men, especially, I think, so I have a lot of clients whose partner, whose male partners don't, yeah. aren't like that's a huge like i feel like that happens with like half of my clients is like their husbands just don't get it or they don't understand yeah. they don't like that i eat different foods from the rest of the family and I, we can go on for days and talking about this but i think yeah. using the i think statements like you said um the documentaries i think are really like documentaries are really easy to absorb right you don't have to read a book like you know no one's gonna read the medical medium book like it's it's really hard yeah. to not easy, but you still sit down and watch a 90 minute documentary. And I think that's really phenomenal yeah. advice for someone like, hey, let's sit down and eat some snacks and watch this documentary together. And I think that's really, really wonderful advice. Um, the last question that I had really quickly was, um, obviously there's um, betrayal is um, really emotionally painful, but yeah. um, physical symptoms as well. And I remember going through my betrayal with like friends and family and things like that, it really declined my health a lot. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I had a very sensitive nervous system and sensitive adrenals. So it really, um, like, you know, it did push me backwards for a while. And, you know, I'm so thankful that we have these tools, you know, the moon meditation really helped yeah. me. That was really powerful for me. We have now these stabilizer shots, like the betrayal and broken trust mm -hmm. stabilizer shots. Do you have any other recommendations for people? Um, yeah, I would say for most people, they don't realize this big hidden gem in the revised and expanded medical medium book, which is the PTSD chapter. Mm -hmm. And 
because trauma and broken uh, trauma loss shock shots are for PTSD. Betrayal shots are too. If you think about it, it's a specific form of PTSD around feeling betrayed or abandoned or let go of um, or hurt. So I would say that um, really one of the biggest tools to consider is unrecognized PTSD. Mm. And many, 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 many people who are chronically sick have unrecognized PTSD. So when something triggers you or you keep thinking about it or you go over it again and again or you feel tears come really easily. I have so many women that I speak to who are like, I spend half the day crying. Mm. You know, I get into trouble for saying crying can exhaust you, but it's true when you talk to women who have cried and cried half the day, they're like, yeah, I'm exhausted. It's not, it's just an observation. It's truth. I experience it too. If I've ever cried a lot, I'm adrenally exhausted mm -hmm. the next day. It's like I'm crashing. So it's really important because PTSD triggers tons of adrenaline, whether you're aware of it or not. Mm -hmm. Because PTSD can be like, in some people, it's like off in a bubble somewhere. And if you touch that bubble, you'll remember it and act on it. For other people, PTSD can be a lived experience every single day that they experience or are in touch with it at some points throughout their day. Some people are in touch with it all day long and they cannot actually break that cycle. And it's unrecognized PTSD because they just think that it's the people or their health or something that's causing them to be this upset. And once we start talking about unrecognized PTSD, their whole stance will change and, the, and it seems like, oh, like I have a solution for something that I was feeling that I couldn't put my finger on that, oh, now I get it. Like now, oh, it's PTSD. And recognizing PTSD is really important because it brings, it, it gives you the opportunity to take down a level of adrenaline that you may be engaging with and not knowing because it can just be like this it can just be there even in the background and as an intuitive you know i feel people's emotions really deeply and i can sometimes feel it like i'm talking to people and behind their words are tears and they're speaking from ptsd and so I will always mention that when I'm speaking to people because mm -hmm. I'm like, I feel your tears. And often if you say it, they will start to cry because it's right there. Mm -hmm. and, and they're living that tearful state all the time. They might feel better sometimes, but they come right back to it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I find that, that that needs to be spoken to. And I think that if anyone who's listening, who is dealing with this PTSD and cannot express it to their families, have them listen to this part of the call because hopefully it'll give them another viewpoint because often family members really don't care when it's their own family telling them, but someone else says it, they might listen better. Mm -hmm. So just for that purpose, it's not like you're wrong, but just hearing somebody else talk about it might add more legitimacy. And this tearful state where people go to tears so easily, which is why I talk about why crying is not the solution for this PTSD state. And people go to it over and over and over again and can actually like become low key addicted to the adrenaline that comes from the crying over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Um, it just keeps them in that loop. So while the shots are great, while all these things are great and it can help, they all help. It is also helpful to really know what you're up against or what you're dealing with because naming the problem is what 50% of the battle, right? So unrecognized PTSD. Um, I think many people think, oh gosh, if I was dealing with cancer or I lost a, a, my mother or, you know, like I went to war, that's super clear and it's obvious and it's recognized by not just people, but society too. Society recognizes PTSD in those conditions. Right. But what about when it's quiet and it's unspoken and it's not a big issue but it's been happening over many, many years over and over again. Like you get into triggers with your partner or you get into triggers around food. Or I was just on a call with food and chemical sensitivities and people talking about how they have so much 
literal PTSD around their food because they get so triggered by little things and it's it's just it's constant and breaking those, those cycles often is the first step for deeper healing yeah because that Battling adrenaline is not easy every day through PTSD. Yeah. And that's kind of the one thing that I would say that I think most people miss. Yeah. Um, uh, is, is acknowledging that there may not be one big event that happened in your life. It can be an accumulation of all these small events and you can't put your finger on it, but you're just in PTSD hell and you don't know it. Yeah. And how would you recommend people go about identifying this? Again, this is just in terms of these states, right? Are there emotions behind the words that you speak to people in normal everyday life, you could have maybe a normal tone, but there is this like feeling behind the words that's kind of always hanging in the background. And do you easily come to tears? That's actually a big one. Mm -hmm. How easily do you come to tears? If you come to tears very easily, you could well be living in a PTSD state that's unrecognized. Mm -hmm. And people think that, oh, I'm just emotional. And they put it down to, I'm just emotional, like normalizing it. Mm -hmm. But we're not, we are emotional creatures and we're supposed to feel emotions all ranges because god made us that way mm -hmm. and we're not supposed to live in a constantly tearful state like if a child was crying all the time being Good. around that child is very distressing right it's distressing to us because we're our brain is registering that something's not okay with this kid so when we're around people that feel like they have this all this emotion as well hanging out you can recognize it in them too right um it's sort of recognizing that there's it can be helpful to go to a therapist to determine if you have ptsd if you cannot recognize it yourself mm -hmm. complex ptsd is very difficult to diagnose sometimes or see mm -hmm. for yourself i find that many people miss it i'm not an expert i'm not a therapist but mm -hmm. i can i can recognize it in people right um, and that's also just from experience and talking to so many people. Mm -hmm. Also, another another um, sign that someone's in PTSD is they have a really hard time listening to you. So you could be saying something to them, but they're not registering it. Mm -hmm. Saying something and you're not registering it. They could be in a PTSD loop because they're really not hearing you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, so um, there's... There's that. So look up in uh, BrainSaver the section on emotional strokes. The sec um, there's a little section on emotional strokes where um, um, Anthony writes about how you act when you're ha having an emotional stroke. And an emotional stroke is where your brain's kind of like stroking out. It's actually, the I think he's describing the mechanism of how PTSD actually shows up in the brain mm. and there's a list of symptoms there um all the symptoms that show that you're in an emotional stroke and <laughs> i was looking at that um you know what i was teaching about it recently and just having gone through just some hardships back in the earlier part of this year i recognized in myself i'm like oh like i was having total like some symptoms of emotional stroke and even in me even though i know it and even like you know, it takes a minute to like recognize it, that you're actually in it. When you're in it, it's really hard to say you're in it because you're right. just trying to live your life and do what you do, right? So mm -hmm. it's just something to pay attention to. I, and you ask like what people, I think that this is what people miss the most is they miss this part um, of like this PTSD and how to recognize it or where it shows up or what to do. If you want, I'm actually just pulling up the slide and I can read it out just so if people want to know what the symptoms are. Mm -hmm. So it says emotional strokes, people most likely to have a stroke, have a combination of elevated low grade viral infections, an imbalance of nutrients, food and hydration, meaning they're de depleted, toxic heavy metals, chemical poisons and emotional shock or stress. So that's included in that, but also showing you that it's not just the emotions, it's like the underlying environment is set up for you to get that stroke, right? Mm -hmm. So examples of symptoms of emotional strokes, inability to think clearly, panic attacks when someone talks to you, numbness throughout your body, fear of communicating with anyone, inability to make decisions, 
losing a sense of time, obsessing that something is wrong, but you cannot pinpoint it, uh, fear of starting something new, fear of leaving the house, allergic reactions to stressful situations. It's a thing, right? Um, where you feel like you just cannot handle stress. You're having an uh, allergic reaction to the stress, to adrenaline. Mm -hmm. So these are symptoms of emotional strokes because when you stroke out emotionally, you can go into PTSD. And I was looking at this list going, oh, I could definitely recognize like five of these things that I was, that I was experiencing myself, right? So um, I think it's, I think it's important that the information's all there. It's just such a great volume of information mm -hmm. that being able to pull it out as and when needed. Sometimes we just don't know that that piece exists in there. And then you want to go seeking it. But I, I'm a huge believer because the books are living words that when you ask a question and you ask for the book, it will, you will be shown. You will go and find the books, go open them up, ask for the right page, ask to be shown in the index where to go. Like you will be shown the angels, God, will guide you and support you. So there's so much there to learn. Yeah. I mean, I'm constantly learning and I, I think I'm in kindergarten. So, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know that I, I don't even feel like I'm in first grade yet with this information. Yeah. There's still so much to learn. Yeah. yeah. Wow, this was um, incredibly insightful. I learned I learned so much from this. I think everyone else in the comments learned um, so much from this as well. I think this will be an incredible resource for the community, um, and I'll be make sure, I'll, I'll make sure to post it on my my page and um, your page as well. And yeah, I I just feel so grateful. And yeah, thank you so much for meeting with all of us and answering all my questions. And I think this was much needed for the community. Thanks for doing it, Satara. It was really amazing to connect with you as well. And I think you and I could 100% have long hours and hours of conversation on all of these topics, which would be so fun to do. Um, but thank you for inviting me and thank you for hosting me. It's my honor. I just, you know, I, this community is so very, very dear to me. And to show up and talk about these topics, it's something we love. We talk about these topics ad nauseum in in our membership program too which is now available if you want to go check it out we have a special sale on it so yeah and just inviting people if they want more support it's available awesome all right guys thank you so much for joining us have a great night everyone thank you bye, bye.